Hey, Eric, how's it going? Hey, KC, what's happening? You have my undivided attention. I'm an uh, open book. Oh, my God. No question is too risque. This is a safe space. <laughs> I want you to have full journalistic freedom. You know what? I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. But I, I support you. I support you. I want to be supportive of you. I mean, listen, as one black man to another, I really appreciate that level of support. Of course. Thank you. I got your back. <laughs> but I want to start, I always like to start at the beginning, you know, whenever I talk to my guests on this, on this show, because you know, I always like to get a sense of what sort of sparked it all, because I know, you know, it's it's well known now that you studied music at Berkeley College, but you decided to pursue comedy instead. And so, you know, what I guess, like, what path did you see for yourself when you decided this is what I want to do? I when I was when I was finishing school. I went to school for the upright bass. Mm hmm. And I it just was becoming painfully clear as I was finishing college that the upright bass was not a future really for me i mean may I, I don't want to discourage anybody who's in school for the upright bass or pursuing a career in the upright bass but for me i was like what am i what am i thinking i was having an existential crisis throughout college as i think most people do throughout college you have that quarter life crisis before you enter the workforce and as my uh, shitty short-lived band was playing shows all over Boston I started noticing flyers for like open mic comedy nights and I just pivoted to stand-up comedy on a whim and fell in love with it right away and then I continued doing stand-up and pursuing it uh, as I uh, when I moved to New York City nice. but uh, yeah I knew I wanted to do something creative in the temporal arts uh, performative arts and uh I just fell in love with comedy right away. Yeah. I've been fine all day. I've been like a storm of weird <laughs> exotic flies. Just, just At least they're exotic. They're not basic flies, you know? Yeah. <laughs> no basic ass flies here. I got like pure tzitzi flies. <laughs> up my shit. I imported them shits. <laughs> oh, you fancy, huh? You went to Hollywood and put your own flies. <laughs> I mean, knowing that you kind of went out, you went into this on such a whim. I mean, like, did you have any perception of like what it meant to actually create comedy? Because I think a lot of people, I think I still think that there are some people who think I can do that, and some people can, and some people, you know, under some people how much can. Work it's, it takes. Yeah, no, it's a ton of work. It's trial by fire. It's like. You learn by failing. It's a ton of work. The more you, you know, all the cliches are cliches because they're true. The more, the more you put into it, the more you get out of it. And yeah, it's it's to this day, it's still trial by fire. You're still falling on your face and your ear. Your, your your failures are in public, and you just got to learn from each failure. It's the greatest. It's the greatest teacher. Did you so. have a big failure? What was your biggest? Film? I think every time I go out on stage or every time I film something, there's some failure, big or small. Um, dude, one time I opened for Chris Rock in New Orleans and I bombed oh. so hard, like booed off the stage. No. It was gut wrenching. And he was so sweet to me that like backstage, he gave me a big hug. And, and he was and him and his tour manager told me about like one time where he bombed in London and I know bombing is part of life, but man, did that audience hate me. And it like never ended. It was like, I got booed and heckled off stage. I wanted to kill myself. And then like, it's Chris Rock. So celebrities come to see the show. Oh, so like my, man. my agent called me the next week and he goes, Hey man, Anthony Mackie said, you suck. I was like, what, what, what are you talking about? He goes, oh, he was in New Orleans filming a Marvel movie or some shit. Went and saw Chris Rock. And he was like, man, that guy sucks at comedy. And I'm talking to my agent like, why are you telling me this? Let me, <laughs> let me process this trauma. <laughs> so now every time I see Anthony Mackie in a movie, I'm just like, yeah, well, I didn't like The Last Avengers. Okay. You made millions off of that, but I still didn't like it. <laughs> You may be worth four hundred million dollars, but I'm on basic cable for now. I mean, because I feel like, I mean, what does that say about you to kind of push through that? Because I, I know, like you said, bombing is a part of life, right? Especially in the career of comedy, like you will get heckled, you will get bombed, even if you like. It's just, it's almost like a rite of passage. But like, what 
like how do you kind of push through that and not say like oh maybe this isn't for me because i mean that's like that's big i mean chris rock in new orleans like this isn't like you know opening for some small comic in some unknown city you know? right i mean like i bombed so much i've been doing comedy stand up for 17 years and i've bombed so much before it just like up until that point i hadn't bombed that hard in a while so that was like my most recent big bomb um it's a part of life also like chris is very sweet I, like right when i got off stage and he go he gave me a big hug he goes don't worry don't worry and the first two nights i did fine it was like the third night i fucked up and he's like don't worry don't worry and he goes ask me what happened when prince opened up for the rolling stones i go what happened he goes it was an arena full of people going boo you suck it was like they were like throwing bottles at him and shit <laughs> So, and he goes, and he did pretty fine for his career, you know. So he he talked me off the ledge instantly, which is very sweet. Of I love but, that. And so for you, I mean, like, what what was that point when you wanted to branch branch out of just doing stand up? Because you know, I'm talking about you develop writing, you know, shooting and writing the pilot for the Eric Andre, what became the Eric Andre Show. So you know, what I guess like, did you always have that vision for yourself? I guess like, when, when did you decide? I want to do stand up plus this because most people just make a career out of just stand up and doing specials and book and touring and all that. But you've actually, yeah, I, I always wanted to do something more visual mm. and more, uh, I guess the word is psychedelic. Yeah. I, I had like, I had different ideas for the show in, in various forums, and I also knew like. E each thing will help each other. If I build an audience with a TV show, I'll, I'll have an audience for stand up. And if I build an audience for stand up, I'll have an audience coming to the TV show. So they kind of work in tandem. I thought like people that were just like road dog stand up comics that were just pounding the pavement doing like the Chuckle Hut in Possum Ridge, Arkansas. That's kind of a long, arduous way of like getting an audience yeah. versus yeah. television film, you know. That that cats that casts a wider net, and you can build your audience um, a little bigger and quicker to come to your stand-up shows rather than just being like a travel traveling uh, joke salesman. Um, so I knew I needed like a I couldn't just do stand-up. I knew I needed like more than just stand-up. Right, right. And so I mean, you mentioned uh, it's psychedelic is 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 putting the Eric Andre show very lightly because that it is a whole trip and i feel like now that it's been around for five seasons we have such a good idea of like what of what it is like what sort of you know the your your approach to it and all that but back then i mean like how did you how did you even like conceptualize something like this because i feel like it's it, in a way yeah I, you know, obviously you're taking the talk show format and kind of you know turning it on its head and you know giving it a you know a tab of you know, acid or LSD or something, and you know, letting it just like roam free. But I mean, there was, I don't think that at the time in like what 2012, I don't think that there was really anything like it. I mean, it, there, yeah, it's just a sum of my, it's a sum of my influences. It's like, you know, it's got some Jackass and Ali G show and Chappelle show and, Tom Green show. I, I love those kind of like high stake, high stakes prank shows, and also like the mock talk shows, like Space Ghost and Jiminy Glick. I, it's just like a, an amalgamation of all my influences, and I just started writing segments. I, I also loved Wonder Shows, in which is on MTV too. Like I just started writing segments based on stuff i like kind of imitating the shows i liked at first and then and then finding my own voice within the within those influences yeah. um but it was a, it was a process like i would just kind of write like uh, like crazy i would try to write at least four hours a day depending on what day job what miserable day job i had <laughs> um so yeah, a lot of writing and filming when I could and figuring out what was funny and what wasn't funny. And, and so even with that, I mean, like, you know, cause you, got, you got picked up, uh, you know, by by Adult Swim. And, you know, I imagine that it's still that same process of writing so much, you know, and I feel like that's in a show where 
really that you can go anywhere like there's really <laughs> no boundaries for this show so how mm-hmm. do you go like how do you set there has to be some boundaries to some degree I mean, because you're not just you're not winging it you have you're writing you're you are yeah. writing things and like and having some kind of structure to it so how do you put boundaries around something that is inherently <laughs> boundless in a way yeah ca- chaotic and, yeah. and Arctic. uh well, it is a talk show, so it follows the talk show template. You know, there's a opening theme song, a monologue, uh, remote pieces, guest interviews, musical guests. It has all those, like, traditional tropes of a talk show dating back to, you know, pre-Johnny Carson. Those tropes existed in the Steve Allen show and and, and uh, those, like, old-school Borscht Belt comics. So we're using, like, a very tried-and-true television format. Um, that kind of gives it its template and and there's definitely like legal boundaries like, <laughs> <laughs> that we've definitely that we've definitely crossed that I've, de- I've definitely I got arrested the first season of the show so yeah, you did. That, that reigns it in <laughs> the law <laughs> cops oh cops <laughs> <laughs> oh cops <laughs> Always killing my buzz. Man. <laughs> but to that, I mean, you you obviously found such a sweet spot in this in this sort of like prank comedy, and I I mean you're you you're obviously amazing. And you you mentioned uh, like Tom Green and you know Johnny Knoxville and like Ali G, all these other and you know Sasha Baron Cohen. But it's I feel like you really have such a knack for it. And so what a what as a performer, what about sort of rolling around in that unknown is so stimulating for you as a creative i mean like what like what about that style of comedy really like like speaks to you uh spontaneity i think that like the comedy works based off an element of surprise and it's easy for my stand-up to get stale or when you're rehearsing a scripted scene too 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 much it can get stale quickly but when you are interacting with real people in a hidden camera prank scenario um it's impossible for your performance to be stale because you are you're using every part of your brain to improvise within the situation and mine the most comedy out of the situation so it forces you to be spontaneous and it's also like a high wire act it's a, it's a kind of like the highest stakes version of comedy uh you know because you're you're putting yourself in danger yeah <laughs> yeah you <are>. <laughs> <laughs> i mean that, that, i was actually gonna ask i mean like because i was i was gonna say like how does that because i would imagine as you as you as you just mentioned that it kind of flexes a different creative muscle like going performing stand-up where you're you know performing for a crowd who's there to see you perform instead of a crowd that doesn't know what the hell's going on like when you just you know storm a location and just like see how people react around you and so i mean for you i was like you i would love to hear a little bit more about how about how that sort of translates into into sort of your overall creative process because you mentioned that it really kind of sparks spontaneity and kind of you know feeding into that a little bit more i mean so does that make you a better writer does that make you like what are sort of what are some of those lessons that you take from the field so to speak that you apply that you may apply to more uh i guess like traditional elements like stand-up like you know writing traditional comedy traditional quote unquote i think test screening is the the greatest tool and it took me a while to f- figure that out like now as we're like just editing this past season of the eric andre show we would do like before quarantine started we would do like friends and family screenings as much as possible with each episode to just see like why in, in its rough shape to just get that instant feedback because stand-up you get instant feedback mm-hmm. if a joke works you get a big laugh if you go if you if it doesn't work you don't get a laugh it's like instant gratification whereas television and film is delayed gratification um so you just pick up more and more tools uh as you trudge through this career like any career um does that answer your question absolutely i feel like it was a two-parter but i forget what the first part (laughs) no 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 that answers i'm trying to like discreetly order a sandwich on postmates (laughs) without realizing (laughs) too I'm like, yeah, yeah, comedy. Add uh, Calabrian chilies to my comedy. I mean, listen. (laughs) (laughs) That sounds 
Jeez. delicious. Listen, I'm a foodie, so we could like we could derail this whole conversation and talk about building your perfect sandwich. I'm happy to give you input. <laughs> I uh, love that. I'm getting chips. I'm being a bad boy. A bit of a rebel. <laughs> I mean, if, and please don't tell me you're getting sun chips. Make them good chips. Ah, so come fun. on, stop, stop. <laughs> They're kettle potato See, chips. Okay. You're good people. All right. <laughs> <laughs> you can tell a lot by some of by what chips they eat. I'm telling you. But, oh, yeah. <laughs> I love a good chip. Nothing's better than that crunch. There's no other food on the planet. I mean, I grew up in Louisiana, so Zaps is like, oh, yeah, Zaps. I, just ha- I just had some uh, evil eye chips not too long ago. Those ones just taste like uh, they've got like um, that Cajun seasoning on them. So good. You got to get you gotta get wrap snacks. Oh yeah, oh yeah. No, no, no. I know what I know. Wrap snacks very well. So good, <laughs> so good. I'm telling you, I can easily go down this rabbit hole. But you know, when it comes to when it comes to uh, season five of your show, you know that was you had like a what like a four year hiatus between it because you're yeah, shooting... we were making the movie. Exactly. So we made season four, then we made the movie for three and a half, Which is four crazy. years, something like that. Then we well, we made the movie. Really, like, cash flowing, like, we're in production. Like, that was three years. And then it takes a year to make the Eric Andre show. So it was four, four and a half years between season. But that's just because the movie was no small feat. Yes, to, which to, we will get to in a minute. But, yeah. I mean, I'm, I'm, I'm wondering if you, if you gained any new perspective kind of stepping away from, from the show for that long. Because I would imagine that it's... It, it, because the show's obviously not done. I, I hope that you have more seasons in you. And it's almost like stepping away from some, you know, master artwork and kind of seeing it with new eyes again. So, like, coming back for season five, like, did you, like, what new perspective did you gain on on the show? I, you know, I I think, and I, and I hope other people share this opinion, that season five is kind of the best season yet. We, we really figured out. So, Jeff Germain was our head producer on 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 bad trip mm-hmm. on the movie and he came from you know f- having 15 20 years plus experience over us with you know three jackass movies and bad grandpa he's made over you know 550 million dollars for paramount right. doing a hidden camera pranks so he right. was really our shepherd through this process and we learned so many tricks of the trade through jeff that like our kind of our, our toolkit um, just like got it, got a steroid injection and like just these little like production tactics that he would do kind of like technical stuff that doesn't really seem like that big of a deal or that would like yield much higher results. But I think before when we started doing pranks on the Eric Andre show at the beginning of the show it was really just like, I would jump out of a trash can and go boo and scare somebody or do some big public stunt and just have people like uh, as like kind of like jaw dropped observers while I was doing some crazy uh, performance in the streets of New York. But Jeff started stressing the importance of the people you're pranking are the real stars of the segment and they get the biggest laughs. So the more they're on the hook and the more verbal they are and the more they believe the premise and are responding to it rather than just kind of like a jaw dropped observing the bigger laughs you'll get. So we really made sure this season of the or this most recent season of the Eric Andre show, the marks were on the hook and um, talkative and interactive. And um, cause I noticed in the test screenings for bad trip, the, the actors aren't getting the biggest laughs. It's all the people we're pranking mm-hmm. got the biggest laughs. Oh yeah. I mean, like, trust me, Rel was hilarious. Tiffany's hilarious. Michaela was amazing, hilarious. Um, but even funnier than them in the movie were some of the things these real people are saying. It's because they're being completely genuine, and they don't even know they're on camera. They they're not even aware they're in the movie. In fact, we filmed them. We 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 did so much of the movie so long ago. We did the majority of the filming two three years ago that this movie is about to come out on Netflix, you know, which has 200 million subscribers worldwide. And like, these people are going to be like, I'm a, wait, I'm a movie star. Like, I don't even like, I vaguely remember some maniacs in a a chicken wing shop in Atlanta, like (laughs) light me up, but I don't, you know, so, um, 
So that's I, I kind of learned that from Jeff, the importance of getting people on the hook and really getting them invested and gassed up and, and getting them to believe because it's like pranking is like a magic trick mm -hmm. getting them to believe in the fiction of the premise as as a reality is is kind of the the magic trick of it all and that's what makes for the most entertaining possible uh, scene absolutely and i i mean i think i would agree and i think a lot of other people agree that season five is kind of like your, it's it's the best season I mean, I feel Thanks, like it's, yeah. no, it's not just me. I feel like, like, look at the reviews. Like, that's what a lot of people, it's, and it's so funny. It's like, again, like, it's such a chaotic show that you feel like it, you feel like there is no rhythm to catch, but there is, like, I feel like yeah. it's just, it's, it just feels like it, it just felt like a really, really well-crafted season. And so, Thanks. yeah. And I mean, speaking of which, it, it's obviously, you know, it's missing, it's missing Hannibal. And it's just like, you know, yeah. Sad, sad, but you know. So I mean, how was that for you? Because I know that you know this is a kind of what is that like for you moving forward with a project that without the person who started it with you, you know, like I, I was, I, I, I was, and still am a crushed, yeah, you know. But I couldn't. For his mind was made up, and I couldn't force him to do something he didn't want to do. And he felt creatively he had done everything he wanted to do on the show and with the show. Thank God, you know. Uh, Lakeith came in, mm -hmm. uh, Felipe came in, Blanable came in, <laughs> yeah. um, uh, you know, fake Reese Witherspoon came in. Uh, we had a bunch of kind of like a revolving door of uh, people just looming over the guests. Because that, that's kind of the most important role of the co-host in my show is just having this third person standing and hovering awkwardly over the <laughs> guests so that when they go when when i'm like driving them insane to their breaking point and they're turning to this other person for salvation they're looking up at another psychopath <laughs> and having to cope with <laughs> having to cope with their own brand of psychosis so the formula for the sh show allowed the show to continue and yeah i i, I i'm still devastated that hannibal decided to leave but I, I couldn't force him and I, I just have to be happy for the amount of I'm, I'm happy that he did a proper send-off and he was at, on season five and had a proper goodbye and a cameo at the very end of the season yeah. but uh yeah it's a bummer but at the same time it was our best season yeah you know what I mean and we really got the pranks down to a science so I think um I think we'll be okay yeah you Totally, but I feel like I mean, did that when he when he didn't want to to continue on the show as like you know a permanent fixture? I mean, did that give you any pause on like should I keep going myself? Like, was it a feel? Because I, I I imagine it's like because it, this goes beyond. I mean, you guys have not to say that you guys aren't friends anymore, but I ima I wonder what it's like sort of building something together, you know, really in the trenches, and then one person is like, "This isn't for me anymore." While you're you know you're staying staying the course did that yeah, make you think would, like should i stay? well i would <laughs> no, totally i was gonna retire the show mm -hmm. i was like fi five seasons that's good that that feels like a good amount of eric andre's show it should be done and even hannibal was like i'm down to keep collaborating but let's do, do something else i think like mm -hmm. what what i've done on the show has has hit my limit but then i got to the end of season five and my crew was so dialed in and my editors were so dialed in and it was so kind of smooth and um, it just felt so comfortable. This group of creative people I've, I've been working with since the beginning of the show were such like a cohesive family. Mm -hmm. And then I'm just like, I was at, I was like enjoying the editing the the end of season five so much. And I was watching Larry David go into his 10th season of Curb Your Enthusiasm mm -hmm. and the always sunny in Philadelphia guys going into their 13th season or whatever, 12th or 13th season and Trey Parker and Matt Stone going into their like 29th season of South Park. <laughs> and I was like, if I'm enjoying this so much, why would I put it into it? It's yeah. sad that Hannibal's gone, but we have such a, family you know there's all these characters on the show and i'm getting bigger and bigger celebrity i got lizzo to do bird up and it just feels like the the stakes of the show have only continued to grow and 
the fandom and fan base has only continued to grow. It just didn't it feel I felt I don't know. I was like, why? It was it's a bird in hand. Yeah. You know, and it's the only it's the only thing that I've ever done that I have pure creative freedom. Yeah. So I, I was like, I don't know. I don't know if I want to let this go. Don't let it go. <laughs> yeah. Never let that go. Because that's something yeah. that people chase their whole lives to get. Exactly. That's yeah. I don't want to take that for granted. You know, yeah. I don't want to be cocky or egotistical about it. I want to to be appreciative of it. Yeah. And Adult Swim just gives me like total carte blanche. Yeah. Shout out to so, them because I feel like that's always yeah. the best. That's always the best way. I, mean, I remember interviewing John Landgraf at FX and he was like, you know, we were talking about Atlanta and he was just like, I just let I just let everyone run with it. He's like, I don't know what it's like. So he's just like, take it, go. Like this is this yeah. is your show. So I feel like it's always great when you hear, you know, the 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 execs with the purse strings just saying like just trusting the vision. They may not get it yeah. themselves, but they're just like, yeah, like go for it. So yeah, crazy. I mean, and it, that rarely happens. And then when it does and it works, it's like the best. Yeah. Yeah. The best. And now, you know. Uh, Donald and, and Hero have like a shelf full of Emmys, so yeah, I guess they're doing pretty well. Gonna... <laughs> but I want to talk about Bad Trip because, yes. oh my God! <laughs> <It was so>... <laughs> <laughs> I mean, you went through every emotion with it. I knew what I was. I knew what I was signing up for because obviously it's you. I knew what the premise was, but I just just stressed me out <laughs> just stressed me. did you watch it to the credits did you yes, see yes. the field that, was, where I'm hugging everybody? that helped so much because yeah. i was just like oh man like that's the headline it should be like watch the credits because <laughs> i want like i want to stress that prank shows usually give me a like a little like a little bit of anxiety because i'm just like oh yeah. god but then just the fact that so much of it was set you you and Lil Rel, two black men going in like <laughs> all these like incredibly white spaces and i'm just like <laughs> get out get out. <laughs> it was very yeah. anxiety-inducing. But for those for those who do who 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 don't know the movie, like I would love if you can just like set it up. Like, what is tell us a little bit about the movie, the premise of it. Well, it's basically it's a narrative, uh, classic buddy movie, buddy comedy road trip movie, but it's told entirely through hidden camera pranks with real people. So the cast is only me, Rel, Tiffany Haddish, and Michaela. You know, me, my best friend, the bad guy, and the love interest and then everybody else on camera are real people that are in not only you know being pranked but interacting with the plot and shaping the plot um which was the greatest magic trick so um yeah we're hoping it's like the next in line of 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 this very new genre mm -hmm. that um you know sasha baron cohen and 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 the jackass guys kind of um i think so created. I think you know? so. And, you know, to that point, I mean, how was it like for you sort of taking what you know, but like, but stretching it to an hour and a half movie and not just like a skit in an episode? It's way harder because yeah. Eric Andre's show, nothing's easy. Eric Andre's show is not easy, but like each segment can just live on its own. Exactly. It doesn't have to like be narrative. It, it, it doesn't have to have any story plot points pay off. It can just be completely psychotic and deranged and absurd and then just end and uh it only has to exist for like two minutes the scenes in the movie they all have to be grounded make narrative sense my character has to remain sympathetic throughout all 90 minutes where i don't have to be sympathetic in the eric andre show i can be a total <laughs> mess of a human being in a different way all my yeah because i i can't be like intentionally destructive like my character couldn't be intentionally destructive on the movie because then he's not sympathetic mm -hmm. so there's kind of principles to movie writing that aren't the same principles to you know adult swim writing right um which is its own niche yeah and you have to give it like medium. i love it because like you know everything it felt like every every setup help move the story in some way because even like with the with the <laughs> with the gorilla that could have just been like some random goofy thing but you're like no i want to take a selfie with the gorilla to send it to, to yeah. it'll impress her and then you know i don't even want to call that hijinks that was just assault <laughs> 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 it's just... so so that was that that scene is a good instance of like we just had that prank 
And we knew if we pulled it off, it would be like a big hit. You know, it got big, the biggest laugh in the, the test screening. Um, and Spike Jones' writing partner, Amanda, came. We were like going through the movie. We're going through like an early version of this, like not even a script, like an outline of like what we had in mind. And she's like, the gorilla prank is great but you have to make it about the quest for Maria mm -hmm. or it's going to feel completely episodic and detached from the movie. So she goes, it can be a, something as simple as like, I got to get a picture because Maria loves gorillas or whatever. Just make it, make it about the love interest that your character is pursuing. Don't make it just independent of, 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 of the plot. Right. And it's like that little piece, um, you know, ha had, had her and Spike and, and Jeff, Tremaine and in Knoxville not gone through all those trials and tribulations in Bad Grandpa, we might have not gotten there. We might have filmed it and not had that piece and had to film pick it up later or like the, it wouldn't have fit in the body of the movie or um, so that's like a good way of like differentiating the writing process between Eric Andre's show where the prank a prank like that can just exist on its own isolated without any narrative right. uh, burden um, uh, versus uh, writing it for a movie. So and so, I mean, what was, you know, kind of to, to uh, my earlier question of like asking like what your editing process is like, because I would imagine that you, this is one of those things like where you probably just had so much footage. I mean, even in like the Red Band trailer, there's like a clip of, you know, Tiffany Haddish's character, uh, Trina, like escaping prison, like clawing out of the dirt to get out. And I'm, I'm not, for people listening, I'm not spoiling anything. I mean, Trina was bound for prison, God bless her. But, you know, I feel like, and that's on to the final cut. So like for this, like what, I guess I'd love to hear a little bit about like how, like what did, like about what actually made it in and like all the things that we may never see, unfortunately. Yeah, I'd say about like, 80 to 90 percent of the stuff we filmed never made it to the final cut but I, I talked to you know Sasha Baron Cohen and and just talking to Jeff and Knoxville and Spike like they said the same thing there's so much of bad grandpa that never saw the light of the day there's so much of both Borats and Bruno that never make it's like like filming is part of the writing process in a roundabout very expensive way because you don't know how you're dealing with so much unknown. Yeah. You don't know how people are going to react to each prank. You don't know if the prank's going to fit in the body of the movie. Um, we're going to release a bunch of, we, we had a scene with Chris Rock in it that, that didn't make it to the body of the film that we're going to release. Um, we had a few pranks that were like super funny on their own that just didn't make it into the, just didn't make it, they just didn't fit yeah. um, into, the, into the body of the movie. So we're going to release some of that stuff. But yeah, you have to film a tremendous amount. And it's a lot of trial and error. So how does that, I mean, how, what is that? Cause I, you know, I guess for an example, you know, the, the opening scene with, you know, you working at the car wash and you get, you know, your, your uniform sucked off. And I, I remember seeing in the credits, there's like another guy at the same car wash, you know, in, in the yeah, movie, so like we did each, we did each. That's another thing. It's like, we did each prank two or three times. Um, and we would pick the best, person or group of people out of each time and then on top of that think about uh, how, how much the editors are burning a normal movie has one two maybe three cameras rolling max on a scene mm -hmm. or they have like the just one maybe yeah we had like 19 cameras rolling for every scene and every scene is filmed like three or four every prank is filmed three or four times so they have to like toggle through like 19 camera angles oh figure out because like not only do you have like a bunch of like we called them adult cameras to differentiate between <laughs> the small little gopros you have like all these little hidden gopros everywhere you have these like robotic security cameras that kind of like hide in bright daylight and then you have like the adult cameras we call them which are just regular cameras but they're hiding in heavily tinted window passenger vans like secretly parked all around the location so um the editors have to go through so many more like reels of footage than than a typical project uh, it's, it definitely has its own um uh what's the term challenges mm -hmm. for sure and i mean it, was this always the because i think as i understand it this wasn't the landing on this sort of you know 
buddy comedy with you know the romantic interest as uh, you think that's the uh the the end of the quest but it's really like you know i love my best friend <laughs> but like, right, right. i mean was that was that always the story. premise yeah it's a love story between the no i mean we yeah. we even like we even went out and pitched like really whacked out ideas like the earliest version of the movie was like uh, me and rel are best friends and we're losers we're stuck in dead-end jobs which is the same and then um there was a film festival coming to town grand prize ten thousand dollars and then my grandma was about to get evicted from her house and she needed ten thousand dollars worth of mortgage so i like i need to film a crazy movie it was really meta it was like i have to go all over town and film some crazy movie using real people because i'm like a burgeoning filmmaker that can't afford to hire actors it was really in the weeds and meta. and as i'm saying it it's like like just think of how complicated that sounds it's like a guy's filming a movie but it's also a hidden camera movie which is already a movie within a movie so it was like a movie within a movie within a movie we went all over town all over hollywood and pitched it to all the studios and they were like what the fuck are you guys talking about <laughs> everybody passed and so we had to like kind of start all over again and and build it from the ground up and we realized it couldn't be like this meta premise it actually had to be like a very simplistic iconic tried and true premise which is the buddy comedy, you know, which has been done a, a million times, but it's important that it's like a very easily identifiable genre with easily identifiable tropes so that the hidden camera, you must want the scenes to be kind of like a predictable setup mm -hmm. premise, but it's happening in real life. Like the, the two black guys going into the country bar is very like Eddie Murphy in 48 hours. <laughs> like you've seen that scene, but we're doing it in real life, right. you know, so or the um, the makeup scene where I run on, I stop the bus yes. and I run on to the scene. We, we, we ripped that off like when Harry met Sally, you know what I mean? Like that is like classic rom-com. Stop the bus. Stop the airplane. I have to tell the, the love of my life. You know, we ripped it off like. But we're doing it in real life in front of real people. So that's like you want the like iconic scene. But then we flip it on its head by doing it in, in real life. Right. And I'm just laughing so much because, yeah, as, as you said earlier, like the stars of the film are really the people having the reactions because that woman on the bus yeah. was like really like, getting emotional. And then yeah. you know, at, the, at, the, at, the, at the restaurant, that one woman who was so invested in what was happening, like when <laughs> Tiffany Haddish's character runs in, like, have you seen these people that you guys come in? And it's like, it's she was so invested. In, like, She's happening? the best. Her name was Jackie because Jackie. her husband's like, Jackie, you're talking too much. <laughs> amazing. it's amazing and so i mean in those moments i feel like and again i mean this is obviously a skill that you've honed working on the on the eric andre show for so long but i mean what is that like being in the moment and trying to like pull stuff out like you're you're again rolling around in the unknown you don't know how these people are going to react and so for you like how much of how much do you kind of poke and prod and try to pull stuff out like if you know if someone's not giving you the reaction that you want, like how do you how do you sort of like make your mind your mind is split where you're performing and you have to stay in your performance, but you're also thinking two steps ahead of life in the editing bay later when you're looking at the footage and knowing what you need. So I'm almost like an, an actor and a performer in that moment, and also a director trying to pull a performance out of an actor who's not an actor, who doesn't know they're performing, who doesn't know they're being filmed. And I, I can't like direct like a traditional director because I'm I'm also performing in this scene. So your mind is kind of split in four ways where you're like you're goading them and trying to pull information out of them. But you still have to commit 110 percent to your performance because they can't be like, wait a minute, is this real? They have to believe it's real and you need specific information out of them. So your mind split a, a million ways and your adrenaline's just like going, 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 going. So it's kind of like a like a runner's high um you're you're kind of almost out of body while you're in those in those moments and it's getting dangerous because you're pissing people off and like someone pulled a knife on you too so yeah yeah the first dangerous. day of filming that was the first prank rel ever filmed in his life <laughs> welcome to thunderdome rel. Like, <laughs> trial by fire clear the trial by blade but like, <laughs> i mean for you like what like because i know this is this is obviously um the director is the director you've been working with with the eric andre show yeah Kikau. yeah who's amazing mm -hmm. and so yeah i guess like what what is that 
collaboration process like for you all? Because then it's it's almost like I would imagine you have like a shorthand, like you've been working with him for so long. And so like, I would love to hear like, what is what is your collaboration process like? We go over, I mean, like he, he's my work husband. We go over every <laughs> single square inch of every idea every single day. Um, but, you know, he's one of my best friends. So that makes it uh, e easier. Um, but we also like argue like an old married couple. You know what I mean? Just because we've been, he, we, we've, we've seen each other at our best and our worst. Um, and the pressure of making the show and making the movie just makes your brain crack. But we, you know, he's there from from uh, from start to finish. I mean, like in the writers' room, we have we bring a bunch of comedians in and we generate ideas together. And he kind of works big picture in like, okay, we need this for the story, and we need this for the prank to function properly, and um and then we'll go and sift through the ideas together um and uh dan curry as well our, our my, my writing partner like with, like the three of us will kind of like dan's very additive and always coming up with ideas and 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 kitao's kind of subtractive and will like take the best of the best the cream of the crop and try to like trim out the fat so they're kind of like my yin and yang mm -hmm. flanking me as i'm like trying to like come up with ideas and kick the tire on ideas and be like use critical thinking to to make sure the ideas are um we're, we're using like the kind of top 10 percent of the ideas um but it's tedious you know we're writing and rewriting every day and then like we'll do like a little like rehearsal in in our offices kind of without the person we're pranking obviously but just kind of like walking through the beats of the prank that we want and seeing if it feels mean spirited or unethical or if it feels good and not mean spirited if it's funny if it's going to translate on camera if visually it makes sense and then we meet with department heads and go over props and costumes and sound and the camera approach and it's it's tedious it's like every little beat in the movie has a bunch of minds on it chipping away at it making sure it functions properly nice and real quick just last question because this is something i always love to ask my guests you yeah. know and given everything that we've discussed and just where you're at where you're at with your career right now i mean how would you how would you define creativity it's a podcast i thought you're gonna say what is your favorite flavor of rap snacks i mean listen right. that's that's, that's <laughs> i was about to say i mean like don't don't betty wop <laughs> Betty Wop, final answer. <laughs> um, how do I define creativity? Yes, sir. Um, creativity is, is finding out a way to express your specific nuanced point of view. And every person is a, a sum of their experiences and um the, the the makeup of the neurochemicals in their mind and um creativity and creative expression is figuring out a way to translate that uh your your specific nuanced personality um through a through a medium of your choice love it love does that it. work that works that works okay. now you make Go go enjoy your sandwich. Run to your sandwich. Okay, <laughs> thank you. I earned my sandwich. You earned that sandwich. <laughs> it's a real pleasure. Thank you so much for your time. Yeah, thank you I too, really man. It, man. I appreciate it. Right, take care. Okay, talk soon. I'm your host, Casey Finey, and this is Creative Conversation, a fast company podcast. 